Okay, so I'm going to give an overview um, on a program in GSK on self-amplifying RNA. Um, maybe move on to the first slide, which is kind of a big picture perspective. So I think the message here is there are a variety of different ways to make vaccines. So what we try, what I tried to do here is kind of, I can't point very readily, but um, so the empirical approach, essentially vaccines very well established over many years, toxoids, inactivated organisms, some replicating, you know, really going back to the beginning of the 20th century. And then there were successive waves of technology that came in to enable us to make new vaccines. And glycoconjugates with Hib in particular emerged in the 80s, um, and strep pneumoniae and men ACYW have, been, have followed up in that same context. Um, in reverse vaccinology emerged at the end of the 20th century. First vaccine license was Bexero, and that's now licensed in almost 40 countries. And, and so there are established technologies that we know can be used to make successful vaccines. And then there are now new generation technologies. We, we particularly are focusing on novel adjuvants, and they're emerging into, into uh, product licensure at the moment and, and really making a difference and viral vectors are looking particularly promising. And we see mRNA vaccines as one of these technologies that's interesting, has some potential advantages, and we need to see quite where it fits. So we have a number of other technologies which we know can enable us to make safe and effective vaccines. And we need to see how and where RNA can, can be utilized. And we have a particular approach to RNA which differs from some of the other RNAs. And this is the terminology we've used, which is a self-amplifying mRNA, an abbreviation of SAM for, for obvious reasons. So the concept is kind of similar to some other RNAs where you have a synthetic production of the RNA, but the RNA we build is able to amplify. So you inject the SAM, it amplifies into cell in the cell in which it's taken up, and you get multiple copies of RNA, enabling much more production of high levels of antigen very quickly. So this is the most simple representation of what it is and what it does. And then we move on to um, a rather more you know, representative composition of what the RNA is. So it's built around an alpha virus genome which I can't point at behind me, unfortunately. So what we've done is replace the structural genes of the alpha virus that allowed it to make vital particles with a gene of interest. Of course, a gene of interest for us is the antigen, the antigen we hope to express. But we've left significant elements of the amplifi amplification machinery from the alpha virus. So we have a large polyprotein that's cleaved into different non-structural proteins, including NSP4, which is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is able to produce multiple copies of RNA. So what, what this means is a single, so people always talk about the challenges of delivery, but if you deliver a single SAM into a cell, you can get multiple copies of RNA from that single SAM. And so, of course, a, 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 what remains a key element is how we deliver. And so what we're trying to do is replace a viral delivery system. And alpha virus uh, was something that was deeply embedded in the technology in Chiron Novartis for many years. And we worked very hard on trying to make a viral replicon particle that we can move even into clinical evaluation. And that proved very challenging. So a, a radical step we took was to say, why don't we eliminate the viral particle and instead deliver the RNA replicon in a, in a simple synthetic delivery system? And that's what we're trying to do here. We're looking for something that's simple, safe, um, and importantly, can be used for repeated use. So in, in contrast to some of the viral vectors, which have pre-existing immunity, or you rapidly generate immunity to the, to the vector itself, the, the, the hope and belief is that SAM can be used repeatedly because we encapsulate it in a synthetic vehicle. 
And the you know, typical vehicles we use are highlighted on the bottom here. One is a, is a cationic nanoemulsion, which we've abbreviated to CNE. And then we also use lipid nanoparticles, which is abbreviated to LNP. And they have different characteristics and attributes. The LNP genuinely encapsulates the RNA, while the CNE, it's more of an adsorptive delivery concept where it's, where it's bound to the surface. So the idea is to replace the viral particle with a synthetic delivery system to deliver the RNA replicon from alpha virus. And now we're getting into a bit more detail about what exactly happens. So you can see behind me, which I can't, um, the concept here of the delivery of the RNA into a cell, ill-defined mechanisms in many ways, but since we're creating a particulate, likely endosomal delivery is, is, a key, is a key element of delivery. So we often incorporate lipids that are helpful for endosomal escape because of course the RNA needs to be in the cytoplasm. And you know, maybe I should have highlighted earlier, um, wh when I look at the kind of waves of successful concepts in vaccinology, what's notably absent is DNA vaccines. And myself and colleagues back in you know, precursor companies actually spent an awful long time trying to make DNA effective. And fundamentally to our mind, it failed. And it was a delivery problem. And it was probably in our mind, the need to deliver the DNA into the nucleus was the biggest challenge that, that was not successfully overcome. And perhaps this is the greatest inherent advantage of RNA, that in indeed you do not need to deliver into the nucleus. So you can have this um, mechanistic um, subgenomic RNA. And again, from the alpha virus perspective, the antigen is encoded along with the non-structural proteins, including the RDRP, which gives you multiple copies of the RNA in the cytoplasm to create high levels of antigen expression within that cell. There's a, a key element going on also in terms of innate activation, which is perhaps beneficial to some extent because we're trying to generate a, a vaccine immune response, but can also be detrimental. And that's something you need to understand in terms of the optimal delivery system. So creating the SAM was an initial challenge because of course we are creating a very large RNA construct. It's actually nine kilobases because it needs to encode the antigen of interest and also um, the o ORF for the large polyprotein that subsequently cleaved. But even when we started out in this, in this effort uh, in Cambridge quite some time ago, in essence, there were a lot of um, approaches that could be utilized and adapt. In vitro transcription was, was already well established. Small commercial kits could to make, you know, up to a milligram of RNA was possible. And even uh, GMP production of relatively small RNA was established. So initially we used the available scripts. We showed that we could make this nine kilobase RNA. We showed that the yield was actually pretty impressive in terms of milligram per mil. And then of course we adapted our own in-house approaches to create this material that could then move into a, a GMP environment. So kind of historically, this was the first um, set of data that was published. The lead author was Andy Geel, who led the, the RNA platform here in Cambridge for a number of years. And this is a simple proof of concept for a vaccine encoded by SAM and utilizing more or less existing delivery systems. So in this first early set of work, we utilized a, a lipid nanoparticle that, it, that was already established for delivery of siRNA. So this is the kind of DLIN, DMA kind of cationic lipid with ionizable head group uh, that was talked about in, in, in previous talks earlier. And so this is a simple proof of concept in small animals, predominantly mice. It's focusing on respiratory syncytial virus F as an antigen of interest and essentially highlighting on this side, which I can actually see, that the RNA can give both CD4 and CD8 T cells. Uh, the LNP significantly improves the potency 
On the left-hand side, you can see something similar where the LNP dramatically improves the potency of the, of the SAM and its ability to induce neutralizing antibodies. And actually, you start to see a favorable comparison because we compared it to the viral replicon particle, the kind of parent alpha virus. And it's actually comparable in potency. And then this is actually a rat model because cotton rats are readily infected with RSV and essentially a similar proof of concept. The, this is an, a non-immunized with high levels of virus. And in essence, the RNA or the LNP or the VRP all offered protective immunity against RSV challenge. So first proof of concept that this SAM can function potentially as an effective vaccine, at least in these small animals. And this is starting to look at the alternative delivery system. This is the cationic nanoemulsion, which is more of a proprietary approach with, within the companies we were working in. And so we weren't sure whether this would work, because essentially the belief was one has to encapsulate the RNA to enable it to be protected, to allow it to be effective. So this is a nanoemulsion based on squalene with a cationic a quaternary amine incorporated, uh, DOTAP, which locates on the surface and then is able to bind the RNA. So you bind the RNA to the surface of the emulsion droplet. And the, over here, you can see that in essence, the RNA is readily degraded in the presence of RNAases. And then when you bind it to the surface of the CNE, it's in fact protected and you can still see the nine kilobase SAM. And then moving on to, well, what do the immune responses look like? This is looking at HIV neutralizing antibodies and stepping into a rabbit, a slightly larger, and, and starting to compare with some more established technologies. So over here, you see the, the CNE versus uh, the, the SAM alone, and you see you can induce high levels of neutralizing antibodies in a dose-dependent fashion. Importantly, we're now comparing with a recombinant protein adjuvanted with MF59, which is a long-established, safe and effective emulsion-based adjuvant. So the, you would expect the recombinant protein adjuvanted with an emulsion to be very potent at inducing and utilizing antibodies. Kind of remarkably, the SAM was comparable in terms of its ability to induce neutralizing antibodies. This was a pleasant surprise and a very different observation that we, we'd seen for many years with DNA vaccines. And this is a publication by Louis Brito, who in fact was also one of my team here in Cambridge for a number of years. And moving on, trying to figure out you know, what we think is the fundamental question. We, have our, we can make RNA, so how does it compare relative to other technologies? Is it better at some things, or is it, is it not as good as what we have? So this is a more of a comparative study. It's in the same publication. It's moving on to RSV as the, as the antigen of interest. It's again looking at CNE, and this is just looking at the small animals. But it's starting to look at comparing SAM to other approaches. And the top here is binding antibodies. Down here is neutralizing antibodies. So ability to neutralize the virus. And here you can see more going on, but perhaps this is the more relevant at the bottom because it's really functional neutralizing antibodies. What you see is SAM is effective over a pretty broad dose range at inducing um, neutralizing antibodies down to microgram levels. This is in sharp contrast to a classical mRNA this does not have modified bases. This is a, um, a, a, a natural base RNA. What you see is, what we think we're seeing here is the ability of the SAM to amplify itself and produce multiple copies in the cell is the characteristic feature. And we're not saying that classical RNA would not induce neutralizing antibodies, but when you're at these low levels, 1.5 or 15 micrograms, obviously the, it's an unfavorable comparison. Um, over here, we also see DNA at similar levels. And again, not surprisingly, we see no neutralizing antibodies, some ELISA antibodies. But again, looking at a comparison with other technologies. So here we're looking at, again, the parent alpha virus replicon particle. And in fact, we're comparable 
to the alpha virus. And again, we see a recombinant protein with the adjuvant MF59, which would be expected to induce high levels of neutralizing antibodies. And again, we're kind of comparable. So pretty favorable outcome in comparison to competing technologies. And this is moving it forward somewhat into a more, perhaps more relevant species. This is non-human primates. Uh, this is again looking at this, a different targets. This is looking at um, antigens from CM, CMV. It's looking at GB, but also a, a combined antigen, IE, IE1 and phosphoprotein P65. So it, it's again, you know, can we move the SAM into larger species and still induce potent relevant immune responses, which in fact was the, the challenge for DNA, which tended to work very well in small animals and tended to not work so well in larger species. So up the top here, you can see that um, we can induce potent ELISA binding antibodies. Here you can see this is, this is responses to GB. You can produce um, utilizing antibodies against CMV. And then over here, you can see both CD4 and CD8 responses against uh, several of the encoded antigens, most prominent with GB for the CD4 in particular. And again, trying to understand how best can we utilize RNA. So this is a study back into HIV, again in non-human primates, again making a comparison and making comparisons with what we think are relevant approaches. The top one, again, is the parent alpha virus replicon. The one at the bottom is the um, recombinant protein, ENV in uh, GPU-140 in the MF59 adjuvant. And in fact, the MF59 adjuvant is now being used in a repeat efficacy study for, for, for HIV vaccines. And so this is a prime boost approach because you know, most people in the world of vaccinology trying to work in these complex pathogens like HIV, TB, malaria, there's a lot of interest to say, do we need two modalities? Maybe one modality cannot give you the full breadth and depth of immune response. Maybe we need a prime boost concept. And this is looking at, can SAM be part of a prime boost scenario? Um, so this is a prime with if I can see around the corner. This is prime with SAM and boost with recombinant protein. This is alpha virus replicol, and this is exclu exclusively recombinant protein. And again, this is published data at the bottom here. But what you see is, again, the SAM can compete fairly well with the alternative technologies. If you're looking at neutralizing antibodies, it, again, in this non-human primate, it's competing with the adjuvanted protein, which is remarkable. And then if you move to the bottom, you're looking at the T cell response and gamma interference secreting CD4s. And in fact, this is where SAM differentiates itself very much from the recombinant protein. The recombinant protein is not particularly good at potent CD4s, whereas the SAM is, and is in fact outperforming the parent alpha virus replicon. So, so where are we now is, looking a lot at mechanism, trying to understand how SAM works, what are the key features. So our belief, based on many years of work and with adjuvants in particular, is that once you understand the mechanism, you have the opportunity to have a productive discussion with the agencies, and, but also if you understand mechanism, you understand how to improve, modify, accentuate and, and get more from the technology. And I, I haven't got time to go into detail, but this was published very, very recently, another paper that came out of the Cambridge team, starting to look at mechanism. And there's just a couple of simple messages I have here. So first of all, not surprisingly, a RNA with the ability to amplify wrapped up in a particle containing cationic lipids is very potent at activating a broad range of immune mechanisms and particularly innate immunity. So this is you know, various comparators and controls where you can see activation of MID88, TLR7, MDA5, RIG-I, MAVs. You're seeing a lot of innate activation. And maybe that's good and maybe it's not so good because what you also see is that not surprisingly, this potent immune response can downregulate the, 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 the performance of, of SAM. 
So this is looking at uh, the impact of gamma interferon. And again, here you can see a knockout versus a natural mouse. And what you see if you have an interferon gamma knockout, the potency is much improved because the interferon doesn't take out the SAM, basically. And then you can see something comparable if you actually have an antibody against interferon. So again, it's clear that the interferon response, uh, the early interferon response, has a negative impact on gene expression. And here, this moving on to the antibody response in the, the knockout versus the natural, in the knockout, the response is enhanced because there's no interferon response to close down the SAM. So, so we're calling this the kind of yin and the yang. You've got lots of innate activation, and you want an immune response because it's a vaccine. So innate activation's good. But you've also got this innate activation triggering particularly an early interferon response, which is going to close down both the SAM expression, but also the immune response that's coming as a consequence. So it's a kind of balance and getting that right is key to getting the immune response you want and perhaps to minimize local reactive unicity. So I started off with saying, where might SAM have a role to play or where does RNA, RNA vaccines have a role to play? It's one of a number of technologies that can potentially make vaccines. Um, so this is a, a slide that really encapsulates what happened in the influenza pan pandemic in 2009. H1N1 emerged. The pandemic was declared in June of uh, 2009. And what you see here is the cases of H1N1. And then what you see here is the emergence of the availability of vaccines. So what this was was the most substantial effort ever done to make a vaccine as quickly as possible with the consolidated efforts of the whole of the industry and a huge amount of pressure from governments to make the vaccine. The various companies took a, you know, a huge hit because they stopped doing many other things and focused on making the H1N1 vaccine as quickly as they could. But what this tells you is the greatest effort that the industry had ever put together collectively to make a vaccine was too little too late. The peak had risen and fallen by the time the vaccine was available. Um, so, you know, if H5N1 had emerged and was highly pathogenic versus H1N1, the argument is we would have been immunizing the survivors. So what this told us is everything we could do with traditional approaches, whether it's egg-based flu vaccine or flu cell culture-based, it's too slow and it's too slow to respond to a rapidly emerging pandemic. And at the time, we were also working on SAM. And we got an opportunity to see if SAM indeed could do things more quickly in a conceptual way when H7N9 suddenly emerged, I believe it was 2011, and it was suddenly being announced that this could be a problem. And this was an actual timeline of we were kind of ready to do this because we've been funded by DARPA to think about this concept. And this is what you see here is the actual timeline of what was done. Um, so in essence, the sequence of H7N9 was available. So it was posted on the internet. People were busy ordering oligos. And then they were busy uh, doing PC, PCR primers. Then they were busy amplifying and cloning into, into a plasmid building the DNA, um, creating the SAM from the DNA template. And in essence, at day eight after it was available on the web, the RNA integrity had been confirmed. And then at the bottom, you see at the bottom, you see the, um, the gels, et cetera, and the immunoblots. And then to the right, you see 13 days later that a mouse was inducing functional neutralizing antibodies to the virus that had emerged 21 days previous. So that this is just a lab-based you know, conceptual representation of what might happen or what could be done. But I think that's in very sharp contrast to the reality of, of what happened in, in, um, in 2009. And I'm, I'm getting the hurry up. That's fine. This is my last slide. Um, so this, this is the concept, uh, you know, what could SAM be or what can RNA vaccines be? Maybe it's a, a, a rapid response 
when an outbreak is declared, when the sequence becomes available, the vaccine can be designed um, in silico and production can, can happen quickly. And that's maybe where, where SAM in particular, we think, has its most um, valuable role to play. And then all I need is my, obviously, conflict of interest statement. I'm an employee of GSK Vaccines, and that must be taken into consideration based on what I've had to say. But thank you for your attention. Great, thank you. And I think we have time for a couple of questions. Very interesting. So you have not talked about immune response from NLRs, not like receptors. Mm -hmm. Do you have any information that you can share with us? Uh, yeah, I mean, about there's, there's, this? Yeah, I mean, there's many things I didn't talk about, of course. Right. I mean, the, the innate activation that SAM in particular does, and RNA does in general, is very much in the literature. And yes, uh, part of the activation is RLRs and TLRs and MAVs and rigor. So not, not surprisingly, a, a, an amplifying RNA and uh, in conjunction with, uh, with lipid particles and cationic lipids is very pot potent activator of innate immunity. There's a lot of activation. Some of it is probably good, and then maybe you need to control that to, to be able to express enough antigen and get the immune response you want while balancing it against the tolerability profile. And that's, that's probably the biggest challenge, I think, to get the right balance of innate activation while being, and getting the adaptive response while being suitably well tolerated to be an, an, an effective vaccine. And you know, this, this is not a new concept. I, I work a lot on adjuvants and it's a similar, you know, you, you want innate activation, but it needs to be controlled such that the tolerability profile was, is within the suitable range for the vaccine you're trying to develop. Just a follow-up question on that. First of all, great talk. Um, with respect to the activation of innate immunity in your J immunology paper, you showed uh, quite a strong activation of uh, many elements of innate immunity, TLR3 and 4, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if um, it it's, it's, could be due to impurities in the RNA. Is the RNA HPLC purified? Are the RNA DNA hybrids, for example, yeah. are, are only a small portion, an impurity in the yeah. process, uh, uh, maybe 1% of the product, mm -hmm. but uh, causes an outsized effect mm -hmm. on activation of innate immunity. So do you have methods to detect those impurities that are a consequence of RNA synthesis and remove those by HPLC? Yeah, and, and, and thanks. I mean, it's a very technical-based question, which, again, I can't get into. But yes, we, we do try to control the various elements to ensure that the innate activation we're seeing is genuinely coming from the formulation we put in. And I guess, you know, we're not the only people who are reporting there's lots of innate activation with RNAs. What we see is fairly consistent with the rest of the literature. If anything, because our, our RNA is able to amplify, perhaps we see more of some things, less of others, but it's obviously related also to the formulation and delivery system. The LNP and the CNE are likely to contribute in different ways. Uh, and like I said, I think the, the, the sweet spot is getting the balance of, we know this innate activation is happening, and it can have positive and negative events, but we need to control it to ensure that what we, the outcome is, is the positive outcome we want, which is adaptive immunity with a good tolerability profile. Thank you. Hello? I uh, can you speak out? Uh, well, the CNE is very cool in terms of the um, uh, stability you showed uh, when compared to just mRNA. How does the CNE get inside cells? Like, what's the mechanism of entry? Yeah, I mean, specifically the mechanism we've not looked at. But again, we know more about CNE than we know about LNP. Because in essence, we built CNE around an adjuvant that we'd used for 20 years and we knew to be safe and effective in you know, tens and tens of millions of people. So it was a good basis on which to build something. The question was, do we have to incorporate the RNA to protect it, or could we get away with a binding concept? And we were pleasantly surprised that the binding concept worked. But there's lots of questions. What about when it's incorporated versus bound? Are we getting into the same intracellular pathways? Are we protecting more or less? 
And these, these mechanistic things are important. We tend to be more on the pragmatic side. Do we get the outcome that we're looking for, which is good adaptive immunity, while looking like the tolerability could be okay? If so, then we're pragmatic and say, well, let's proceed and see if in humans that's, that's the right way to go. So mechanis mechanism is key, but sometimes we don't have the time to stop and explore only the mechanism. I'd say that needs to happen in different arenas and perhaps in the academic arena. Our job is to try and make vaccines, so we tend to have a more pragmatic perspective and try to make progress. Fair enough. There was one more question on the end. Can you talk about, Can you talk about um, RNA modifications, whether you use any in your IVT and also whether you detect any in the amplified RNA? And, and that's, that's an interesting one. We do not modify the RNA, uh, and it would not be beneficial in our setting because, of course, we have this very large RNA, but it, has, it, it encodes a number of things beyond just the antigen. So we need to have expressed all these, these, these four non-structural proteins. They need to be cleaved, and they need to be functional. So the whole mechanism of SAM is the ability to amplify the RNA. So we need all these crucially functional poly proteins working in the cell that the RNA gets into. I think it would be challenging to make that happen if you start to manipulate too much the, the RNA. So we, we stick with the natural RNA. I mean, in terms of the base modifications for the IVT, do you use the four natural uh, nucleotides? Or yeah, you... yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood the question. But yeah, we, we do use the natural uh, nucleotides. crux of the question is, when do you think this will get to the clinic and become something that... And, and they're two different questions, I'd say. So, okay. so, you know, obviously we're very interested in moving to the clinic yeah. and we're doing all the necessary steps yeah. to enable us to move to the clinic. But, the, I mean, there's still many discussions about is it both technologies, is it a single technology, does one lead, should we do a head-to-head? And it's, you know, to, you've got to get to the clinic to understand the fundamental question. And the fundamental question is, is RNA like DNA? And I really hope not. Or is it really like it looks in these smaller animals and has a real chance? But then how much RNA do you need? Mm -hmm. Because, of course, you know, you, you formulate the RNA into a number of delivery systems. And likely, they will have a dose-dependent toxicity of their own. So if you, and, and, and you know, somebody brought up cost of goods issues, which is another important thing, because that's which arena is it suitable for? Could it be a routine vaccine used in lots of people? Does it have the cost structure? Well, it's, it's very dose dependent and it's very tolerability dependent. We believe SAM is advantageous because of course we believe we can use very low doses, which then impacts the cost of goods, but also impacts how much of a formulation you need to deliver it and so we hope that's on the favorable side of tolerability, mm -hmm. but we need, we need to do that. I mean, we, it, obviously we follow the field and uh, we've seen some initial human clinical trials happening with, with non-amplifying RNA. The data is both encouraging and then gives us some caution because there's some local tolerability issues, but the doses are high. So we need to know what dose is necessary for SAM. Mm -hmm. But, you know, do we want to do this in the, in the clinic? We have to. Yeah. And it's building all the necessary infrastructure to have the GMP, everything there to enable you to do it. That's where we are. Oh, fantastic. Well, good luck. Thanks. Okay. Well, let's uh, thank Derek for the excellent talk.